about the second chapter of your sixth unit that is sexual reproduction in flowering plants in this topic we have already covered two topics first one is microsporogenesis that is the formation of pollen grain and microsporangia and second one is megasporogenesis that is the process of formation of embryo sac and female gamete also called as egg today is the third topic and in this topic we are going to elaborately discuss about what is pollination what are the types of pollination what are the agents of pollination and how this pollination helps a plant or much better help a flowering plant to uh, transfer the gametes i hope in my previous two videos the topic concepts was very clear to you and uh, uh, in today's topic again we are proceeding for third topic that is pollination uh, so uh, as in the first lecture only i told you that the whole topic has been uh, classified into three important uh, stages three important categories we all have studied in uh, <clears throat> chapter number 1 uh, that is the stages of sexual reproduction so first one is pre fertilization stage then double fertilization stage and then post fertilization stage in pre fertilization stage we have already covered pollen grain formation this we have already covered that is also called as a microsporogenesis we have already covered embryo sac formation and today we are going to cover two topics first one is pollination and second one is pollen pistol interaction this topic is a little bit uh, elaborate little bit uh, extensive so keep your patience and watch the lecture till the end so let us start the today's topic well as far as pollination definition is concerned i think you all have studied about this in your previous classes pollination can be defined as the process of transfer of pollen grains from anther to stigma from anther to stigma this simple process is called as pollination pollination is a physical phenomenon that means a pollen grain transferred from anther rests on stigma physically when this pollination uh, if we talk about the plant kingdom uh, there are much diversity but here i would like to highlight the two higher plants first one is pollination in gymnosperm and second one is pollination in angiosperm if you talk about pollination in gymnosperm there the pollination is called as direct pollination why because there the pollen grain in gymnospermic flowers stigma is completely absent so no stigma was present there in gymnospermic uh, plants the and uh, the the pollen grain is directly transferred to the ovule and that's why it is called as direct pollination while talking about angiospermic plants it is here termed as uh, indirect pollination because the the male gamete the pollen grain is not directly reaching to the embryo sac but it rests on the platform and that platform is called as stigma and from the stigma it extends the pollen tube and that pollen tube through the pollen tube the male gamete reaches to the female gamete so that is again a uh, important interesting fact to know called as a direct or indirect pollination well uh, in our previous topics uh, we have already studied uh, that pollination is basically of two types yes pollination is basically of two types 
uh, one is called as a uh, self pollination another one is called as a uh, cross pollination so as far as uh, pollination is concerned if you, if you see here again this is called as a uh, cross pollination in cross pollination the transfer of pollen grain takes place from anther of one flower to stigma of another flower anther of one flower to stigma of another flower this is called as cross pollination and while we are talking about the self pollination self pollination means it is a transfer of pollen grain from the anther of same flower to stigma of same flower so here the anthers which are formed uh, the pollen grains which are formed in the anther they are transferred to another flower that is called as a cross cross pollination and here the anther of same flower is resting on the stigma of the same flower okay so that's why there are generally there the pollination can be categorized as uh, cross pollination or uh, uh, self pollination and this simple type of definitions we have already studied now today we are going to little bit more elaborately explain what is self pollination and what is cross pollination and what are the main well uh, broadly if you talk about uh, pollination can be categorized into three categories now by the time we have studied two categories one is called as self another one is called as cross but now we are going to discuss about three different categories of pollination okay the first one is called as an autogamy auto means same gamy means fusion marriage the gamy word means marriage so auto means same and gamy means marriage so here autogamy means the transfer of pollen grain from genetically similar plant to stigma of the same genetically similar plant okay so here if suppose this is the flower and suppose this is the stigma and suppose this is the anther so here the anther will the anther will rest from the same stigma uh, same anther to the stigma and this is called as auto auto means self auto gamma the another part here you can see and that is called as gitno gamma gitno gamma again a very important uh, type of uh, uh, pollination so we will discuss in detail and last one is called as zeno gamma zeno gamma zeno means different so here as genetically identical parents are getting transferred here the genetically identical type of parents are not involved so here the two gametes are involving from two different genotype and that's why it is called as xenogamy broadly uh, it is also termed as autogamy or allogamy okay when we are talking about autogamy so it is again autogamy is here when we are talking about allogamy so xenogamy is a pure example of allogamy because the anther from different parent genetically different parent fuses with the uh, stigma or fuses with the female gametes of another uh, genetically different parent. so these two cases are a little bit more important to understand now let us elaborately discuss about all these three types of pollination first we will begin with autogamy so as far as the definition of autogamy is concerned it is the type of self pollination self pollination means the genetically similar parent genetically similar parent means the the genotype of pollen grain and genotype of uh, female gamete ova or uh, egg the both genotypes are identical the both genotypes are same well autogamy is a type of a, a pure self fertilization or self pollination okay and the plants undergoes various types of adaptation to ensure this autogamy because if the flowers are open now just try to understand like this okay if the flowers are open 
the anther and stigma both are exposed if anther and stigma both are exposed it can take place either by autogamy or by xenogamy or by gynogamy there are some plants which initiates uh, autogamy which favors autogamy because as a result of autogamy the genotype of the plant will remain conserved and the plants are producing a genetically identical offspring okay because the both gametes that is pollen and egg they both belongs to the same genetic constitution so here for ensuring autogamy that autogamy must take place for ensuring autogamy a uh, plant undergo two types of modifications okay one is called as castogamous one and another one is called as clistogamous castogamous castogamous casto means open so in castogamous flower the flower remain open okay and as a result its anther and stigma both are exposed but such type of flower favor the pollen tube formation of same species of same genetical uh, pollen tube okay so and another here is called as clistogamous clisto clisto means close okay uh, in clistogamous flower uh, the anther will uh, uh, the flower will remain in a uh, the flower will remain in a bud form okay see all of us we know very well that whenever during the formation of a flower first of all flower is a bud then this bud open and it forms a flower this process the opening of a bud to form the flower this process is called as anthesis anthesis so in clistogamous flower the flower will remain in the same bud the bud does not open when bud does not open definitely the anther and the stigma both has no option without self pollination so such type of such type of conditions such type of cases the flower has to adapt adopt self pollination strategy self pollination mechanism so there is a question also in your uh, uh, board examination or uh, in your ncert that which type of uh, flower uh, 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 ensures 100% autogamy so which types of flower ensure 100% autogamy that is clistogamous flower there are few plants in which both the type of gametes are present uh, both the type of flowers are present okay for example here i have taken an example of an uh, oxalis so in this oxalis plant uh, you can see that on top floor it is a castogamous flower this castogamous flower remains open and that may receive or may not receive the genetically identical pollen grain but at the base of this at this portion you can see these portions are the here some buds are present okay so here the buds are present and these buds are called as clistogamous flower that means there are these are the buds and these buds never open okay they does not undergo anthesis anthesis means the process of opening of a bud to the flower so this process does not take place at lower floors okay now the question arises why 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 uh, such type of modifications are there why not the flower open to enhance the chance of 100% fertilization and 100% pollination okay a flower does not open right this benefits the plant how because if suppose if the flower is open so there are multiple pollinating agents are there these pollinating agents bring the pollen grain from some different flower to the stigma and if the pollinating agents are not there so definitely the pollination does not able to take place to ensure the chances of pollination 
that pollination must takes place such type of adaptation are adopted by various types of plants so some more common examples are as you can see here a beautiful flower of commelina oxalis that we have already discussed and viola you can see here again the purple color very important flower that is called as a viola okay so for ensuring autogamy cleistogamous cleistogamy is important right moreover in casogamous flowers also autogamy takes place but it is not 100% for casogamous it is not always 100% but for cleistogamous it is definitely 100% and the reason i told you that the floral bud does not open so keep this uh, in your notes in a very very important way. right and whatever the progeny are whatever the progenies of autogamy are formed the, the progeny is genetically identical to their parents genetically identical to their parents right okay next one is Next one is gitnogamy. Uh, gitnogamy is a type of uh, pollination in which the pollen grain transfer from one flower of the plant to the another flower of the same plant. Again, I am repeating. Gitnogamy is a mode of pollination in which the pollen grain transfer. from one flower of the plant to another flower of the plant that is anther of one flower and stigma of another flower the transfer of pollen grain takes place and these two flowers should belong to or must belong to same plant same plant so again the question arises why so so just remember about our uh second uh, lecture of chapter 1 we have discussed about monoecious and dioecious plants monoecious plants are the plants in which both male and female flowers are present but they are located at different part of okay so for example if suppose this is one plant it has the anther only anther no stigma it is a male flower and This is another flower having only pistil. So here the pollination in gymnogamy the pollination takes place from anther to stigma, anther of one flower to stigma of another flower of same plant mode of same plant. Right. In much better way you can see here that this is suppose. It it takes place in monoecious plant also, or moreover, it takes place in bisexual flowers also. It is not so. Ki only it is takes place. If for monoecious, it is mandatory. If monoecious plant want to maintain autogamy, then gitnogamy is a mandatory process for them. Okay. So here also, in, in this is the condition of bisexuality that the flowers are bisexual. So here you can see that the anther. This is the anther. And here, some yellow color pollen grains are there. It is very clear to you. These pollen grains are transferring from one flower. This is one flower from one flower to another flower. Suppose this is uh, one flower, and this is suppose the second flower. So here, the pollination takes place from anther to stigma. Clear? One more thing I would like to highlight here regarding the uh, uh, gitnogamy. Gitnogamy. is functionally cross pollination because as per the definition of cross pollination we know that anther of one flower to the stigma of different flower so that is happening here anther of one flower to the stigma of different flower these two flowers does not belong to same body means the same part anther to stigma does not belongs to same flower anther belongs to some other flower stigma belongs to some other flower so functionally such type of pollination are termed as cross pollination but genetically it is similar to autogamy okay because both pollen grain and stigma belongs to same plant 
pollen grain and stigma belongs to same plant. Hence, the the genotype of progeny will remain I exactly identical to the parent one. Okay, so it is functionally cross pollination and uh, genetically autogamy. These two words, uh, please keep in your mind. It is important. Okay, well, talking about third one, and that is called as xenogamy, a pure example of allogamy. or termed as pure cross pollination cross pollination okay so in this process what happened the uh, genetically different parents are involving in it okay and here the pollen grain as you can see the pollen grain from anther of a different flower belongs to different parent is transferred to stigma of a different flower. Okay, so here the anther is transferring from different parent and it is landing to the stigma of a different parent. This type of pollination is termed as xenogamy. Xeno that is different. It is an example of pure cross pollination. And it is also termed as allogamy. Why called as an allogamy? Because allo means different. The two gametes, that is pollen grain and uh, egg, the two gametes are belonging to two genetically different parent. Okay, and that's why it is called as an allogamy. <coughs> so, uh, in this diagram here, in a very short introduction, I have summarized all the uh, type of pollination also. So as we talk about first one is autogamy. So autogamy is an example of pure uh, self fertilization. We have a straight about chasmogamous flowers and clistogamous flowers. Clistogamous flowers are those flowers which, which does not undergo anthesis and the flower will remain in the form of a bud. Second one is gitnogamy. Gitnogamy that is transfer of pollen grain from anther of one flower to stigma of another flower belonging to same parent belonging to same parent so kitnogamy is functionally cross pollination and genetically it is autogamous and third one is we have said about pure xenogamy that is it is the transfer of pollen grain from anther of one flower of genetically different parent to stigma of another flower of genetically different parent Right. So by this, there are three important, uh, you can say, uh, types of pollination. Now here, the uh, question arises that uh, as far as it, as far as the flower is autogamous, uh, undergoes autogamy, it is good. When it is undergoing autogamy, so external agencies are not required for transferring pollen. Okay, why? Because the flower, anther, and stigma both are present at the same place. So it is very simple to transfer the pollen grains. In gitnogamous flowers also, uh, chances of self pollinations are uh, do persist. No problem with that. But in xenogamy, when the pollen has to travel from one anther uh, to another uh, stigma, there some important agents are required and these agents are termed as pollinating agents so let us have a look well pollinating agents are important for pollination uh, uh, these agents may be biotic that is may be uh, living organisms which are responsible for carrying the pollen grain from one to another plant or they are also abiotic in abiotic type that is 
the uh, non living materials which are responsible for transferring of pollen grains in abiotic category again there are two types two important pollinating agents are there first one is wind so if the pollination takes place by wind these are called as this is called as anemophily anemophily okay so pollination takes place by wind is called as anemophily in most of the grasses uh in palm plant uh, the palm is not a rhizus form but uh, again uh, the uh, air is acting as a very important agent for carrying the pollen grains second one the pollination is takes place through water that is called as hydrophilic hydro means water philous means loving so you all uh, studied about in chemistry uh, you all studied about uh, phobic and philic and all those things so fish by bat so when the pollination yes bats are also pollinating uh, you have seen the uh, kadam uh, tree of a kadam okay so you, uh, in kadam also water phenomenon is termed as hydrophilus and pollination by insects which is termed as entomophilus let us understand what are the adaptation of flower and how such type of pollination can takes place so first one is first one is anemophily anemophily it is the uh, mode of cross pollination in which the cross pollinating agency is wind pollinating agency is wind that is pollination takes place through air and hence it is called as anemophily this phenomenon is called as anemophily anemophily uh, takes place in most of the angiosperms in various angiosperms and there are particular adaptation of such type of flower simply by seeing the flower only you can understand now whether it is anemophilous or it is entomophilous or it is hydrophilous or whatever it is so what should be the adaptation for anemophilous flower let's have a look these points are very very important okay so let's have a look the first one is flowers are small and in small and in conspicuous these flowers are very small and they are inconspicuous and they have a packed inflorescence they have a packed inflorescence because insect or water does not uh, don't want to enter inside the flower so they have a packed inflorescence second one is flowers are colorless orderless and nectarless flower does not have any color because color is basically for attraction of insects flower does not have any order or scent because again that is a main characteristic of for entomophilus flower here the pollinating agency is wind so wind can neither smell wind can neither see so all this type of multiple adaptation or nectar these all things are absent in flower male flower are abundant this is again a very very important point male flower is abundant see what happen in anemophilous flower there is a flower a male flower and here the wind is carrying the wind is acting as a agency so wind has to take pollen grain from anther to stigma this process is a very very least sure process least sure process there are uh, chances of loss and there is a huge chances of loss so for that for ensuring pollination the uh, male flowers are abundant many male flowers are there so that many 
pollen grains can be uh, brushed at the same time and can be carried by wind at the same time. Okay, and similarly, the stamens are also abundant. And one more thing I would like to tell you about here regarding the stamen of Anemophilus plant. Here the stamen can rotate in three situations because it is completely non-directional. So for example, if this is the filament and suppose if this is the anther. So this anther can rotate as per the direction of wind because if it does not rotate, the anther may detach from filament and no pollination could take place. So for favoring the pollination, for favoring the pollination in the direction of wind, the anther is revolving on the filament. Again, it's very important. Next point I would like to highlight here that anther are small and non sticky and light also. Anther is very small because they are larger in number. Okay, they are non sticky. Non sticky means they should not stick to the surface. So that does not have any sticky coating outside. Right, and these anthers are light. These anthers are light. So that it can be easily carried out by wind. Right. So anther should be small, it should be non sticky. Because suppose uh, if wind is taking the pollen grain and if the pollen grain sticks to another surface, so definitely that, that uh, does not uh, prove the pollination. Okay. So that's why it should be non sticky and it should be light so that it can be traveled long and long distance. A uh, very important adaptation uh, you all have seen in the in maize plant in zia maize also called as a corn corn plant. Okay, corn plant is basically a monoecious plant. That is, the male and female both are located at different places. Male flowers are at different place and female flowers are at different place. The female flower only develops into the fruit and that fruit only we are uh, cooking for our purpose or we are eating okay so the fruit what we eat having multiple grains that is actually the female flower which converts into the fruit that zia maize is also a anemophilus flower that is the pollination takes place by wind and there there are two important modifications which ensures the wind pollination that is, the first one is cob of maize has elongated stigma and stem. The cob, the lower portion, you must have seen that lower portion has various hair like projections. Okay, and that hair like projections is nothing but it is stigma and style of female reproductive part. Stigma and style of female reproductive part. Okay, so uh, for example, we can see here. Okay, so these are the, uh, the, the uh, these are the female flower, and here what is the you can see the hairy hairy line. Like it is something like this, and this has multiple hairs which are coming out like that. You all have must have seen like this. Okay, so this is the uh, from here to here. This portion we know. This portion is the. Uh, the female part that is the uh, ovary which later on develops into the fruit but what are these hairy parts these hairy parts are called as cob cob okay and these cob are elongated stigma and stem so that they can increase the surface area and so that the pollen grain can easily land over the stigma another one the main influences is Tessels. Okay, the tessels are uh, the tessels are nothing but they are the stem, modified stem. As you can see, it is a type of an inflorescence in which multiple stamens are present here. Multiple stamens are present here. Stamen are enormous in their number, and that this element is called as a tessel. So these two questions are again very important. What is the significance of tessel? of zia maize and what is the significance of cob of zia maize okay so tessels are 
stem cob is cob are these are the cobs so cob are what they are the modified stigma and style of female one more important adaptation you see in most of the anemophilus flower here the male flower is always present at the top of the plant body you can see here this is the male flower which is present at the top of the plant body and the female flower is always present at the bottom part or lower part of the uh, plant body this again to ensure the pollination because if male is present at the top part more and more amount of pollen grain can disperse very easily with the current of wind but if female located on the top part definitely the chances of receiving of anther uh, uh, receiving of pollen grain will reduce hence the female always occupy lower part and male always occupy higher part okay so uh, if uh, some of the examples uh, we would like to uh, see here of animophilus flower so animal uh, that is amaranthus that is cannabis uh, coconut the coconut and date mulberry so all these are few of the examples which is possessed by the which possess animophile okay next one is hydrophile so hydrophile is very simple as animophile there the pollinating agent is air here the pollinating agent is water so all the aquatic plant are hydrophilous simple no all aquatic plants are not hydrophilous hydrophile definition it is the type of pollination in which water is acting as a pollinating agent water is acting as a pollinating agent okay such type of plants are called as hydrophiles it is not so that the plant should present inside the water or in the water though the plants are present in the water but there are various aquatic plants which are not hydrophiles can you name them let us take an example first one is water lily lotus water hyacinth if you see the flowers of these plants they are exposed up from the surface of water so here water cannot do anything with the pollination okay if if you talk about the lotus lotus we all know it has a very beautiful flower very uh, fragrance flower with good nectar so there if you talk about the lotus, the first one is uh flowers are flowers are small and flowers are small and is conspicuous and they should be they, they should like okay the second one is flowers are orderless and nectarous again here it should be orderless and nectarous because the pollinating agencies are abiotic so they does not have a sense of smell or whatever it is the perianth is unwettable again very important point the perianth of the flower should be unwettable though the pollen grain should be wettable because it has to stick but perianth should be unwettable the pollen grain has mucilaginous cover in animophilus flower we have discussed pollen grain should be dry pollen grain should be light here the pollen grain has a mucilaginous covering which can prevent the pollen grain from decaying in the water and this is again one more very important adaptation just remember we have discussed about exine and entine the two layers of pollen grain in the hydrophilus flower exine is absent exine are not present 
Okay, so out of the two layers, what we have studied, this is the inner layer in time and this is the external layer. Exactly. These are the vegetative and generative nucleus we have already studied. So this layer, outer layer that is exine, this exine is completely absent. Hence, it is important to prevent or important to protect the pollen grain and that's why it is the entine. Uh, that, that, that's why it is the mucilaginous covering which should cover the entine. The next one is the pollen grain should be long. Uh, sorry, the stigma should be long, sticky and unbettable. Long, sticky and unbettable. That is again uh, important. So these are few of the adaptation of the hydrophilus. Well, hydrophilus is basically uh, of two types. Uh, One is termed as, in one case, the pollination takes place on the surface of water, on the surface of water and in other case, the pollination takes place in the water. So on the basis of these two, hydrophy hydrophily is again be classified into hypohydrophily and epihydrophily. Hypohydrophily means the the pollen grain releases inside the water, they travel inside the water, they reaches to the stigma which is present inside the water. So the pollen grain, uh, pollen grain does not come to the surface and it does not float. The pollen grain remains in the, in the water and keep on floating in the water. It is called as hypohydrophilic, hypo inside. One of the best example is sea grasses, that is zostera. In zostera, as you can see here, this is the male flower. Here you can see this is the male flower, and here this is the female flower. It, this is the surface of water. It is the surface of water. So here the pollen grain releases from the male flower and it reaches to the female flower. These are small, this one, this one, this one, this one, as you can see, these are the small pollen grains and these pollen grains from male flower it reaches to the female flower. But this pollen grain does not come to the surface of water. It remains inside the water. Why? That is due to density of the pollen grain. Okay. Uh, the density of the the density of the pollen grain is exactly equal to the density of the sea water. Sea. Okay. okay. Why? Because it is zostera is called as sea grasses. They are present in sea. Okay. So density of the pollen grain will remain same to the water, and that's why the pollen grain never comes up. They remains below the surface, and they keep on floating in flo below the surface. Right. Another one is that is called as epihydrophily. Epihydrophily means here the pollen grain floats on the surface and here the female flower present on the surface of water. Here both male and female both flowers are present inside the water. Here male flower is inside the water. As you can see here, they are the stamens male flowers and female flowers are present on the surface of water. So the pollen grain has to release as you can see here the pollen grain has to release and it will come to the surface of then this pollen grain will flow and reaches to the female flower reaches to the stigma and there it will form the pollination. One of the best example of epihydrophily is bellicinaria. Okay. So, hypohydrophily, zostera, fertilization, uh, pollination in the water. Epihydrophily, valicinaria, uh, pollination on the surface of water. These examples are very important. Okay, an examination they can ask how the pollination of zostera is different from valicinaria. So, keep it in your mind. 
Next one is uh, again just if we will focus a little bit more <coughs> because in Wellison area very important mechanism takes place. Okay, and again this diagram is from your book only. So here <coughs> these are the uh, main flower. So once du during the pollination, what happened? These flowers released from the inflorescence and come and start floating on the surface of water. Okay, and here. These are the uh, female flower, and this female flower you can see here. This is a stigma. Okay, so here the stigma is something like this. Like this. So the, 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 these are the stigmas. Okay, to increase the surface area. As the male flower reaches to the female flower, and remember, this is not anther. It is not anther, it is a male flower. Okay, as it reaches near to the stigma, the male flower bursts. And as the male flower bursts, multiple polar grains stick here. Polar grains stick here. When once the polar grains stick there, and when once the pollination takes place, which leads ultimately to the fertilization. When once the female flower gets fertilized, then a very important mechanism is once the fertilization is over, this female flower, this female flower is start coiling itself. Start coiling itself. And due to this coiling, the female flower, which is exposed on the surface, pull down. Pull down due to the, the tendril formation. Okay. So that is the mechanism of Valisinaria. Uh, next one is entomophily. Very important, very interesting. Entomophily, most of the pollinating agents belongs to insects category. Okay, so uh, the pollination in which pollinating agents are insects are called as entomophily. What are the characteristics of entomophilus flower? First one, flower is large and exposed so that insect can easily visit the flower, take the nectar, as a result the pollen grain can attach to their body and then it can turn. Another one, flowers are colored, very important in anemophily and hydrophily, flower was colorless. Here it is ordered, there it was orderless. Here it has nectar, there it was nectarless. So whatever colorful flowers you can see, they all colorful flowers belong to entomophilus category. Okay. Yes, very very important term that is pollen basket. Such type of flower which undergoes animal, uh, which undergoes entomophily, they uh, they accumulate their pollen grain at a single place, and there only the nectar glands are present. So that is called as a pollen basket. So insect attracted toward the nectar. As a result, it reaches inside and uh, 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 the pollen grain stick to the body of the insects. And that's why it is called as a pollen mass. And here for more adaptation, pollen grains are covered with pollen kit. Pollen grain should be sticky, otherwise it will not stick to the body of insects. In anemophily, the pollen grain should be dry. Here the pollen grain should be sticky. Okay, and here the stigma should also be sticky because when once the flower, when once the insect is bringing the pollen grain, the pollen grain should stick to the stigma. Then only the pollination followed by fertilization can take place. So uh, uh, there are uh, some very important adaptation which is possessed by entomophilus flower. Okay, uh, insect does not only depend for nectar or scent and does not always attract toward a uh, flower just because of color. Okay, uh, But there are multiple other modifications, there are multiple other symbiotic relations which takes place between flower and uh, insects. So let us take one by one uh, such type of examples. Yes, the first very important example is or uh, specialization, entomophilus specialization is the relation between fig and wasp. Okay, fig flower, as you can see here, this is the fig flower. So, fig flower has 
hyperthodium type of inflorescence fig flower has hyperthodium type of inflorescence that is it is completely closed so as a result the vast enters inside the flower and it is the safe place for the vast to lay so at the base of the stigma as you can see here at the base of the stigma vast lays egg vast lays egg these egg the modified into the larva okay and then it will flow and in this of that the flower get pollinated so the pollen grains can stick to the body of vast okay so that is called as vast uh, and vast relationship important modification of entomophilus specialis second one more example is salvia very beautiful flower salvia Here, for cross pollination, there was few, few such like few type of modifications. For example, uh, here there is a, at the base of this is the stigma, and at the base of the stigma you can find here there there is a nect nectiferous disc which secrete nectar. Okay, so whenever the insect at uh, here you can see the stigma is closed and not open, and the anther is. Uh, fertile and the anther is outside. So what happened? Uh, this is the sterile anther loop. This sterile anther loop is colored, and due to which the insects get attracted. So as it attracts the sterile anther loop here, at the same time the pollen grain stick to the body. self pollination takes place and salvia has a very good adaptation for, for promoting cross pollination okay so in, now what happen when when the anther from one flower, when the pollen from one flower stick to the body of insect reaches to the another flower this insect reaches to the other okay so here what has mature stigma which is it was closed the stigma Okay, the stigma is exposed, then anther, and when it does, it transfers the pollen grain. Okay, so this type of modification, cross pollination, all of salvia. Another one more example is the yucca and moth. A very important question is also there in your book that yucca and moth both cannot complete their life cycle without each other. They both are depending upon each other. Why? Because this is the yucca flower, and and this is the moth. The moth lay egg in the at the base of the ovule, at the base of the embryo cell, and inside the ovule. Okay, this help moth that the egg are prevented from predators, and at the base of that the yucca flower get pollinated. So both are depending upon each other. is a very important and that is amorphophallus flower amorphophallus also called as amorphophallus titanum also called as titan arum titan arum the largest inflorescence okay uh, the largest inflorescence the height of this inflorescence is approximately 2.5 Or more than that. Just for a small comparison, for a small comparing, I have shown here that here is one of the botanist which is standing, and you can see the height of the flower or height of the uh, inflorescence. The largest flower below is Rafflesia. Rafflesia is the largest flower which is total root parasite, and inflorescence uh, amorphous is the largest inflorescence. So this amorphous also provide a safe base for laying of egg to the insects, and in contrary, it undergo uh, 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 the exchange of pollen grain takes place. For more a very good example, we can see in Ophirus and wasp. Ophirus is an orchid plant, and 
one of the petal this is the ophirus flower one of the petal of ophirus flower this it is modified as the female bee the abdomen of female bee it appears as a abdomen of female bee due to which male bee get or male wasp get attracted when it copulate with this petal actually it is not a female bee but the wasp cannot understand that so when it copulate with this petal this phenomenon is called as pseudo copulation pseudo copulation pseudo copulation and on the exchange of that here this is the exposed stamen as you can see and this these flowers are pollinated okay through the wasp so these are few of the uh, specializations which uh, is important which are there in your syllabus okay and this is all about the pollination pollinating agents important modifications or adaptations of pollen grain uh, of a, of a flower for pollination and some modifications of anemophily hydrophily and entomophily flower so i think we should close today uh, by this topic only in next class we will understand that what are the modifications which prevent self pollination and initiates cross pollination this phenomena is also called as self incompatibility and then or then again we will see uh, the pollen pistil interaction in the next class so till then take care and keep on revising vacations started this is the best time to drill yourself for the upcoming examination thank you take care bye bye